Today our message is uh, Mercy Unlimited. And if you have your Bible, you can turn to Luke 15th chapter, and we'll talk about the prodigal, which you may be familiar with. Uh, when we talk about mercy, it's, uh, it's uh, pity. It's showing something to someone, towards someone who really needs it. And it's shown by someone who has the resources to provide it. And you and I, being Christians, have a certain amount of ability given to us by the Lord to show mercy to people, to be pitiful to the poor, uh, to the sick and afflicted, to people that really have a need uh, in their lives. And we have that privilege to do that. In this 15th chapter, we read in verse 11, And he said, A certain man had two sons, and we're only going to talk about the one, and mainly the father, the man. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me, and he divided unto them his living. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country. And there wasted his substance with righteous living. And when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in that land, and he began to be in want. And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into the fields to feed the swine. Those of you who don't know what that is, it's the pigs, hogs. And he would fain have filled his belly with the husks that the swine did eat, and no man gave unto him. And when he came to himself, he said, How many hard servants of my father's have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father, and will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hard servants. And he arose and came to his father, but when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him and the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. But the father said to his servants, Bring forth the best robe, put it on him, and put a ring on his hand, and shoes on his feet, and bring hither the fatted calf, and kill it, and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead, and he is alive again. He was lost and is found, and, and they began to be merry. In verses 20 through 23, I want to reread. He arose and came to his father. But when he was yet a, a great way off, the father saw him and had compassion and ran, fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. But the father said to his servants, Bring forth the best robe, put it on him, and put a ring on his hand, and shoes on his feet, and bring here the fatted calf, and kill it, and let us eat, and be merry. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that we can look to this lesson of the prodigal son, the father, and learn from what it what you are to us and how what a privilege we have of having a heavenly father and when our hearts are aching and hurting and troubles surround us you're always there with your love and goodness your mercy your kindness your pity toward us and the grace that we need to live bless this day may we learn from this lesson to accept your mercy but also to be merciful and we'll give you all the glory in Christ's name. Amen. 
when we look at the lesson, we actually find the expression through this Father of mercy that our Heavenly Father has toward us even more abundantly than, than this uh, Father could possibly have. Uh, one of the verses quoted in Sunday school was, uh, is one we ought to memorize uh, and live by it where it tells us that let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. It's always available, but it's not always accepted. And I believe it's the first time I heard it put this way, and Brother Bobby Paxton, who's with the Lord now, he said that the mercy and the grace of the Lord is going to only be available at the moment it's needed and not so you're not going to put it in a box and store it up for tomorrow you're going to get it as you need it and I, I agree with him you need God's mercy it's available to you uh, his grace is always sufficient for you but I, it's a fact that a lot of Christians live uh, with the energies that they can muster up I guess is a good word uh, to live by until they finally realize that I can't do it and then they can honestly fall on their face before God and cry out for mercy and find the grace at that moment so they need it but when we look at this story we find that this father had eyes of mercy I can just imagine I try to imagine I can't imagine fully but this son getting all of his part of the inheritance up front before the father dies, going off and living the way he did and wasting it away and, you know, eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow we're going to die anyway, and having nothing, no uh, a famine in the land, no food to eat, having to hire himself as a Jew which is the lowest thing you could do is feed hogs and going off and having to feed these hogs and living there with them and eating the very husk of the corn that they ate and just imagine what he must have looked like by all of this living that way uh, maybe we would get a little bit of a picture if we I've not been around anyone like this but uh, the people that have that live homeless homeless without the the conveniences that we have we have no we have all the convenience in our home we can take a shower you know if we need to two or three times a day or just restroom facilities everything's just there I mean if it's a hundred degrees outside it's uh, 72 or 4 or whatever we set it on inside we but picture a person that not doesn't have any of that and then you look in your cupboard and you say boy there's plenty of food there I mean there's uh, sometimes I've noticed about me and my grandsons we get things and we first thing you know we wasted it because we didn't cook it in time and it's gone uh, plentiful you know what I'm saying probably you have the same thing in your cupboard and the kids may even be saying well what are we going to eat pull some of those cans out and see what it says and open them and <laughs> warm them up <laughs> we don't they don't he didn't have that he had what the hogs had whatever that uh, grain was the husk that they ate but here's his father watching, and I almost know that he must have watched for his son every day, hoping he would come home. Uh, Jimmy, uh, forgot his name now. It almost came right out. He used to be governor of Louisiana. had a song, come on, come on home, son, it's supper time. I used to just love to hear him sing that song, and I could just see that mother calling out, come home, son supper time and I can just see this father with a yearning heart 
for his son to come home. Come on back home, there's plenty to eat. I figured the father was smart enough to know that his boy didn't have what it, enough wisdom yet to know what to do with the inheritance and probably would waste it away. And besides going away from his uh, surroundings and into a far country, which was to say he went into something he wasn't even aware of, what it might would be like, and he was aware of his son, and, but he's looking, constantly looking with the eyes of mercy. I know my son's got to come home. I, I know he's got to come home. And it says, and his father saw him. And I could just say a picture of this father with all the love of a father when he saw his son uh, so rugged looking, so shabby, no shoes, probably hair that looked like mine in the morning when I get out of bed, just, you know, terrible looking. Clothes is just nasty. Uh, I, I, I like, uh, I was listening to a country song uh, radio and, and they played a song by Johnny Cass that, where he had a bad night and then he gets up, it's Sunday morning something, and he goes and looks in the closet, he says, to get his cleanest dirty shirt, <laughs> you know. I did that the other night. I, did, I have two Steamville football shirts, and I couldn't find them, and I looked, and they were both in the dirty clothes, so I picked them both up, and I, they're both dirty. <laughs> I was going to wear the cleanest dirty shirt, but I didn't. <laughs> uh, Anyway, uh, this boy, no doubt, stunk. <laughs> have you ever been around hogs? Uh, you have. Oh, my, my, my. I fed a many of them. And I get chewed out sometimes for smacking, but uh, I can tell those that uh, do that never fed hogs. <laughs> uh, you know, you get used to watching them. They <laughs> I mean, I like to eat like that. Anyway, uh, uh, they nasty and they stink, you know, unless you have a way of washing their pen out, and we never did. So this boy, right, he was, had lived in that, and his father saw him that way. And, you know, I could see a father, a lot of our fathers today would run out and say, you don't, you don't, don't come back here. I can't believe you would even come up here looking like that to start with. You can hit the road, Jack. You don't belong here. But this was a father that was a Christian, and a Christian with a lot of love that had been developed in him by his heavenly father. And not only did he see him, he had legs of mercy. The Bible says his father ran out to meet him. And I have an idea, I don't care if he's old as I am, he ran hard as he could run to get to his son. And I could see it, meeting that boy that came home. Hadn't been able yet to express the love he's fixing to express, but given all the energies he had to get to his boy. And that's exactly what Jesus did. And it's Charlie's teaching on church, and I don't remember the title of it, Charlie, but it's about the importance of being a member of the church and pointing out the love that we should have because the Lord loves his church. I wish every Christian understood that lesson and would have such a deep love for the Lord's church as the Lord has given them to love it. That this... This is a, the Lord running, meeting, looking, and watching for one person, uh, those that have gone astray, to come back. And not any resentments toward them, no anger for what they've done, but just a, a desire to see them coming back humbly, knowing that they have a place with him. And so he ran out to meet him. Uh, with all the pity that he could bring uh, to his son. 
He had arms of mercy. The Bible says he fell on his neck. Nothing like it. Being able to have someone back in your presence that you've loved and and really feel the depth of that love toward them and being able to express it. And, you know, the Lord Jesus to the lost sinner is saying, come unto me. Come on. I'll give you rest. All of you that are labor heavy laden. All, I don't care how many hogs you fed. I don't care how drunk you've been, how many drugs you've been on. I don't care what you've done. I don't care if you're the worst woman of the night or the worst uh, man of the night. I don't care what you've been coming to me. All you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And praise God, he does give rest. So he came and he fell on his neck, and he showed mercies he, that he had kisses of mercy. In the older, in the foreign, foreign countries like Russia and some of those countries, they greet each other with a kiss on the, the cheek. We greet with the handshake. Uh, it's a greeting, but it's a show of compassion. Now, whether they mean it or not, that's not the issue. That, but the point of the kiss is a show of compassion toward the person, and so he shows pity shows pity toward a person that needed it, a person that was wanting it, but a person that had humbled himself to, to the point to say that I've dishonored you so much by sinning against heaven that I don't even deserve to be called one of your son or your son. I, I will just be a servant. I'll, I'll do whatever you want me to do, but I'm hungry. I'll just take a piece of bread, but I'll be your servant. And he fell on his neck the Bible says his father kissed him. I've been in the ministry 41 years, and I, hear, I rarely hear this kind of attitude from people when their children have done them wrong. The attitude is driving them farther away. If they are doing good, they just brag on them and hold them up, but when they do bad, they put their foot on their head and push them down farther drown them. If they're about to drown, they'll help them out. May God teach us to keep our eyes peeled toward the direction where that kid left. And may God help us to run and meet them when we see them coming back. Run and fall on their neck and kiss them and make them welcomed back into our lives. Where there's none good no, not one, and you're not good. I was talking to a person at the nursing home, and she said, I'm a really a good person. I said, well, then you define what the Bible teaches. We were joking with each other. But I said, the Bible says there's none good, not even one. So what we look at when we see our kids that do us wrong, we think we're better than they are. We may be closer to the Lord at the moment, but we're just as capable of being as sorry as they are because the heart's desperately wicked and only God really knows it. It's good right now, but the next moment it can be spitting out curse words right through your mouth, just like that. Father gave words of mercy. He said, he said, then the Father said, listen, what's he going to say? You ever, some of you may be old enough to remember the advertisement for investment company E.F. Hutton. It says, when E.F. Hutton speaks, everybody listens. When the Father speaks, we need to shut our mouth and listen. And don't be afraid to say, I didn't quite understand what you say. Because he wants you to understand what he's saying. But the 
Father said. He showed mercies of covering. The Father said, bring forth the best robe. Can you just imagine this? He hasn't even had a bath yet, so he's cleaning him up and putting on the best robe, covering him, making him look really good. I have a picture in my phone uh, uh, on my birthday, I guess. I don't know. I forget what. 21st was the birthday. But I don't know what day that was. Friday, I guess. So this was sad Thursday, the day before. And I was at the football game, and uh, I have so many uh, uh, verbally adopted grandkids that I can't keep up with all of them, but this was one of them. Came up and got on my lap. Two years old. <laughs> wasn't a 27 or 8 year old one. Uh, the little boy right back there, Reed, got on the other side. And the mother of that little girl took my picture of these kids and then sent it on the phone to me later. And I'll say if I didn't look so good between those two kids. Made me look good. I said, you know what? A rose makes a thorn bush look good. Look at this thorn bush with two little rosies. Folks, the father covered him, made him look good. He's all right now. And he showed mercies, he, that he had sovereign mercy. He said, put a ring on his hand. And only the father has the authority to show royalty. Put a ring on his hand. This ring right here was put on my hand December 25th, 1960. And I feel honored to wear it. I feel honored to get to look at it. I feel honored to sing to Paula and tell her, you place gold on my finger. But just imagine our Heavenly Father placing a ring of royalty on our finger because we're his children, robing us with the best robe, covering totally so we look good. But he had uplifting mercy too. The Bible says in verse 22 that he put shoes on his feet. Sometimes I come over here early Sunday morning and you don't want to drive by because <laughs> I just slip on a pair of short pants and barefooted and come up and I have to watch where I walk because the pecan holes or whatever hurts your feet you know and I am tender footed so uh, most of the time I go put my shoes on I'm glad to have shoes I don't know uh, when we were young we looked forward to May as, as early as my mom and dad would let us go barefooted but when we worked in the fields you didn't want to go barefooted. That sand would burn your feet. I don't. You just couldn't get them tough enough. Seemed like. And we we were proud to get a pair of work shoes. And they better last all that year, maybe even the next, if you didn't outgrow them. This boy didn't have any shoes on. Can you imagine how far he may have walked, coming back home? I'm told that they may not do it anymore, but the, the Mexican people down in old Mexico have crawled for miles uh, showing, trying to show humility they're, they're to going to wherever they have to go to the Catholic church or whatever. And their knees are bleeding. and They do that in a show of respect their sins, won't be forgiven of their sins. We don't have to do that. We can just fall on our face before the Lord, just thank Him because He's already paid the price when He shed His own blood for our sins. He offered a feast of mercy. Now picture this, the gospel, the Great Commission, is go into the world and teach, you know, make disciples, win them to Christ. Bring them back and get them 
follow the Lord in baptism. That's the first act of obedience, outward act of obedience. Is get them to follow the Lord in baptism. Then teach them to observe all things whatsoever that he's taught us. Teach them to observe those things. That's the reason we have Sunday school, church, after a person's saved, you don't just bring people in here to get them saved. You bring them, you go out there and win them and bring them in here to follow the Lord in baptism, and then you teach them. That's feeding. That's the feast part after they're home. This boy came home, and I'm not saying he was a lost sinner. I really believe he was the father's son all the time he's gone, but the word dead means to be separated, and no, no fellowship. He was out of fellowship, totally out, no communication. And he was wherever lost would be. They didn't know where he was, but he came home. But we can also picture a lost sinner like that, and the Lord looking for him and, and sees him and gets him and brings him home. And he, he says, he bring here the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat. Kill the best one we got. And then we'll have good fellowship of mercy. And so he said, let us eat and be merry. merry. In other words, come and dine. The master calleth, come and dine. You don't have to stay where you are if you're not where God wants you. Just like that, you can be where he wants you to be, feasting with him, enjoying the fellowship with him and with his people. If you're sitting in this congregation and you haven't accepted Jesus Christ as your own personal Savior, that's the first thing you need to do. He died on the cross to pay for your sin debt. He paid it all as we sing the song. And he said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. And he stands with open arms saying, come unto me. All you that labor are heavy laden and I'll give you rest. And so he's pleading with you to come. And then he wants you to follow him after you've accepted him in baptism. That's a picture. That's a, an identification of the fact that in your, from your heart you believe in the death and burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And you picture it by your uh, bearing the old uh, man and being raised up in the newness of life. And then come and be in the services as often as possible so you can learn in other words feast on the things of God and grow and be a strong Christian but first things first Paul said I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures that he was buried and rose again the third day according to the scriptures that's first things that he paid your debt your first thing is to accept him as your Savior. As we all stand, we have our song leader, our instrumentalist to come, and we invite you from right where you are, trust Jesus, and come and let us know that you have. What page, brother? 326. The very first verse, 226. Come on, while we sing the first verse. 